Hey, what's up? It's your boy Abe from Life by Abe coming to you with another expat interview. Today, we are interviewing the incredible, the magnificent, Venice. All right. Venice and I have known each other for what? Four years? About four years. Yeah. Um, one of the first people I met after moving to Vietnam, and we've decided to get together and film this interview. So stay tuned and watch out for the fireworks. All right. Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, so, Venice, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica a while ago. And then I moved to Philadelphia when I was about five years old. I dabbled, that's the only way I can say it, I dabbled in law a bit. Before I moved to Asia, I moved to Asia in 2008. First tour of duty was in Korea for 10 years. And then I moved to Vietnam in 2018. I've been in Saigon for a while and now here I am in Hanoi, trying some new things. What, going all the way back to 2008, Okay. what made you decide to leave Philadelphia? What I saw was a whole bunch of new condominiums and houses going up in areas that I was like, if you can afford a condominium or a house, you probably don't want to live in this area. And I saw them advertising all these prices and I said, oh no, the bottom is going to fall out. And also I just wanted something new. I was like, I just want to change everything about my life, try something new. And I decided to give it a shot. I figured I'd be in Asia for a year or two. And it was a match made in heaven. Okay, okay. Now, 14 years later, do you look back on it and is there anything that you would change in your journey? I would have come to Asia sooner. Okay. That would have been the main thing. Because I wanted to come to Asia for a while, but I was sitting on the fence. I, I would have come sooner. All right, Bernice, you've been living overseas for 14 years. You've had some ups, you've had some downs, you've had some all around. Tell us about your best or worst experience while living overseas. My, the best experience I've had living overseas, especially in Asia, is that a lot of the Westerners that move to Asia are actually misfits. They just really don't fit in wherever they are for whatever reason. We just, it could be politics, it could be just the way we see economics, whatever it is. But the best thing about living in Asia is that there is a community of misfits. And I see it no matter where I am, whether I'm traveling in Thailand and I'm hanging out with people who are doing a gap year and they're 24 and they're telling me like, you gotta do the full moon party in uh, Copenhagen and we're gonna do all the body paints on you. And I'm like, no, and they're like, yes. Or whether it's being in Korea and you're just hanging out with people and you're hearing all their different stories about all their different misadventures and it happens in Bali, and it's happening in Hanoi, and it's happening in Saigon, and I just feel like it's a community of misfits that makes me feel whole, and we're trying everything, and I think if I hadn't moved to Asia, I would not have opened up a business with friends, and truly stayed friends throughout the entire business. Okay, okay. What's the worst experience that you've had? I say the worst experience, it's definitely going to have to do with race. Just having people either, I don't want to say mislabel me, because obviously, you know, dark skin, yes. Obviously, my ancestors are from Africa, but everything that goes along with that, having people feel, answer their own question, they're like, you're from blah, 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 right? But I would say that uh, the worst experience I've had really has been in, uh, there was one time where I was teaching and these students would just not stop saying the N word and trying to get them to understand that when 
they go to move abroad, because they were all prepared to move abroad, I said to them, your worry is not going to be, you know, black people attacking you or censoring you. I said, I think it's going to be other Asian people censoring you because they don't want to be associated with that. They don't want to have that, you know, fresh off the boat kind of um, affiliation with them. Have you had, with your experiences with race, has it all been verbal or like that, or were there any, was there any violence towards you? Uh, never any violence towards me. All of it was verbal. And not necessarily, not always malicious. Sometimes it's just a misunderstanding and the more I learn about the different cultures that I associate with, I realize, okay, you know, like, uh, this is the origin of this misunderstanding. But I found that every time I've kind of called people out on something, like they, there was never any pushback. Like I felt like everyone wanted to be educated. No, no, I, that's why I'm still here. Like if it was all bad, if it was that bad, if it was physical or whatever, um, I would have left. Now, we're talking about other people learning and you learning about other cultures and everything as well. What would you say the, if you could pick one lesson, what would be the one lesson that you would say you've learned while living in Nothing is universal. Whatever you think, uh, there isn't any belief that is universal. There isn't any body language, any gesture, any motion. Uh, no experience is universal because I think when I first moved to Asia, I did not understand. There were so many things that I just thought, oh, this is common to the human experience. But that's not true. So I'll give a funny story. Because I feel like in America, everyone tells you, like if you drink and get drunk every day, you'll never hold a stable job. Then I moved to Korea. Turns out not true. You can drink. You can get up, hold a stable job. See? Just like that. Myth busted. <laughs> yes. We've seen that. Uh, yeah. 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 A lot, yeah. a lot. Okay. Especially in Korea. Yeah. yeah. You see it a lot. And uh, so we've talked about your, your positive experiences. We've talked about the negative experiences and the lessons learned. Let's move on to pros and cons. What would you say would be some of the pros or cons of living abroad and moving away from the U.S.? The pro of it is just, I'll say, safety is the number one thing. Like just feeling safe walking down the street, feeling safe in my apartment, all of those things, I cannot, I, I can't trade that for the world. And Another big pro, going back to the Misfit thing, is you are just meeting so many people. I would have had to travel around the world to meet this many people from so many different countries. I did not realize that there was, because when you're in America, you don't think of an expat community. And America really doesn't have an expat community. They don't really have like expat enclaves. But in in Asia and I lived in Ghana, you do have that. And so you can easily just tap into a group of people who are like-minded, who share a lot of your ideas about seeing the world and starting new businesses and just adventuring. And they tell me about so many different experiences and it gets me motivated, excited. And it's just like having a free National Geographic or living National Geographic um, lesson or Lonely Planet come to life uh, every day as I meet uh, people who are living abroad. So I think that's the pro. The money is the pro also. Because most of the places that I've lived, 
they've been cheaper than living in America, so I get to also uh, save more money, right? And I'm close to everything, especially in Asia. When you're in Vietnam or Korea, you can travel so cheaply to so many other Asian countries. So it's like, oh, okay, I want to go to Thailand for the weekend, book it. I want to go to Japan for the weekend, book it. And I love that kind of freedom. Uh, the con, I would say, is being homesick. Like being away from my family, being away from my friends, that's very hard. And being away from the clothes size, the shoe size, you know, the makeup uh, that I want, and the food, right? A lot of times the food that I want, maybe the cocktails I want, but I'd say on the whole, and more and more every day I find that, you know, you might call it little imperialism, but everything that I really want is starting to flow into uh, Vietnam. It's definitely flowed, it definitely is present in Korea. And, you know, good life. And then there are other things where I'm like, you know, I probably didn't even need that thing. So I'm glad that it is not there. Okay, okay. That, that is good. And I've also seen that. By the way, if you're watching this, the only thing I'm missing are York peppermint patties. If you want to send me some, do you want anything? Ooh, what did I do? Something that I wanted in that way. I, I kind of want real Oreos. Good. So if you, if you decide you want to send us anything, send us some real Oreos and some York peppermint patties. And if it's Girl Scout cookie season, Ooh, send the Girl Scout cookies our way. All right, do that, do that. All right. So. You've told us the pros and cons. You've told me about your best experience and worst experience. But I'm not quite satisfied. And I don't know if our listeners are. I want your most amazing experience that you've had while living Most just like the number one. You can you can tell no one else, you can tell no other stories except for this one story to get your friends or family members to come and visit you. Uh, visit me in Asia. Right? Visit you in Asia or visit you anywhere outside of their home country. I'm gonna say I was in Indonesia in a place where it doesn't even show up on the map. It just it's near Papua New Guinea. So it kind of shows up as being like the edge of the world. And I decided to climb a volcano. And the guy leading me up the volcano was a nine-year-old, which I, you know, I'm against child labor, but he's very spirited. And just having him lead me up and down the volcano it was just one of those sitting atop a volcano. Number one, um, if a volcano is still active, you don't actually want to sit down because it's hot and the lava is still moving. So yeah, I had that experience where I sat down. I was like, ah! But being at the top of a volcano and seeing a group of islands that were newly built, or newly created by volcanoes. It was pristine. Like in a way that, as much as I like the Aegean when you're in Greece or uh, Croatia, again, all of the sea is very beautiful. I'm from Jamaica, sea is very beautiful, but just seeing the beautiful coral and everything like that, I would say to everyone, take a trip to a place that is pristine, that is unspoiled, right? a place that people don't normally go to, and just see something that is amazing, like truly amazing, not something that is just, not something that Instagram can easily capture, 
And when I was atop that volcano with that nine-year-old and his father, I just thought to myself, like, number one, I can't believe I just climbed up a volcano. Um, but this, this is amazing. This is amazing. Like this island, I'm looking at islands that are newly formed, islands that are only inhabited by animals, not inhabited by humans. Because there's one island that's just Monkey Island, right? No humans living there. Thought that was a beautiful idea. And FYI, if you're ever going down a volcano, uh, just give into it and slide down because ash is um, it's quite smooth and there's no way that you're going to just be able to run down. You just have to kind of give into it. Okay, okay. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so looking back, you had this such an amazing experience of you in the middle of nowhere where maybe less than 1% of the pop world yes. population have been to. Now I want you to go to the exact opposite. And I want you to tell me your worst experience. What you want to erase from his, from your history, from the history of Venice. What is it that you're looking for? What would you, what story would you say you would never want to experience? What is it? I uh, what is it? Maybe the toxic positivity has come over me. But I will say, um, my sister was visiting me in Korea. We're in Seoul. We're at a very popular nightclub in Itaewon. So if anyone knows Seoul, you know Itaewon is the main strip with foreigners. And it was my, it was the second to last night and I hadn't been able to spend a lot of time with my sister because I just started a new job and that was already wearing on me. And then we were going out of the club and this Korean American guy just turns to us and he said something like, I write Shaquita, Shaquana, Moesha something like that and immediately like anytime because I'm the oldest of uh, five the oldest of six sisters but you know so I have five younger sisters I'm always protective of them even though we're two grown women and I just thought to myself like why and I knew in that moment if I started like going back as I said to him what did you say and he was with this Korean girl who just, and I always feel bad because when people do a lot of these things, there are times where the person who's with them thinks that something friendly is happening. So she's like, oh, what, what, what? And I knew in that moment, if I started going back and forth with him, it was going to just, it was gonna look ugly for me because no one was going to understand what it meant when he was saying, all right, Shaquita or Shaquana. He's, like he's saying, he just said about, he's like, oh, Shaquita, Shaquana. He was like, no, no, I don't even want this beef. I just wanna back away. And I probably gave him the middle finger and said something, whatever, to him. But I was so heated at my sister. I just didn't want that to be my sister's experience in Korea. But we calmed down. We probably went and got some McDonald's and walked home and just reminiscent of our childhood. Just had a good time. Okay, okay. Wait, McDonald's in Korea? I love McDonald's in Itaewon. <laughs> That's where I rediscovered the McDonald's breakfast. Oh, explain. I need no, to know more. No, when I was in America, I had stopped. You know how you you're bad and bougie, you get a few dollars in your pocket, so you start acting brand new. You're like, I don't do McDonald's breakfast anymore. I want to go to the diner. I want to go to, you know, like the place that, you know, they mention it's Sex in the City or wherever. And I remember I was, you know, like I told you, drinking. Drinking with friends, and it was about 4 or 5 a.m. And this guy who had a crush on me, 
said, he was like, let's go to McDonald's. He was like, gross. He was like, no, no, let's go. So he orders breakfast and I said, no, I won't be eating any of that. And he said to me, I, you're gonna, well, he said something like, I'm gonna put my sausage in your mouth, so open up. Yes, that's what he said to me. And I was like, no, he's like, do it, do it. And I took a bite of that sausage egg McMuffin and I was hooked. And ever since then, I've been back on, oh no, ever since then I was back on McDonald's breakfast in Korea. In Vietnam, thankfully, it's uh, less uh, available because that McDonald's breakfast, I mean, I've seen people order 12 hash browns ooh, at 5 a.m. and go. Yeah, okay. so yeah. But yes, I rediscovered the McDonald's um, big breakfast, you know, the one with the hot cakes and the sausage and the eggs. <laughs> nice. Now I have to go to Korea and try McDonald's and eat it. Thank oh you. my gosh, Thank so you. good. Now I'm hungry, now I'm hungry. Anything can happen. Number one, I just want to let you guys know, anything can happen at the McDonald's in Itaewon, in South Korea. Like people will do pole dancing, people are doing tricks, like anything that you think can and will happen, people are breaking up, they're getting engaged. Anything that can and uh, should not happen, anything that should not happen, anything that should happen will happen in the Taiwan in Korea. No, no, I just have to ask, is there only one McDonald's in the Taiwan? Yeah, there's only one. Only one, okay, okay. Oh no, it, and it's infamous. It is an infamous McDonald's. All right, you heard it. You heard it, ladies and gents. You've got to go to the McDonald's in Ite One and just keep a watch. Well, it's also one of those things like if you haven't met anyone at the club, then people normally they throw it on the last. They're like, "All right, I wasn't able to seal the deal at the bar or the club." So then they're like, they go double time at McDonald's. Like all of a sudden, because the line is very long. People are like, hey, da da da, start chatting you up. They're like, why don't we? You know, we can, yes. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of guys think that they can get, um, you know, they think if they can put their sausage in your mouth, they can put their sausage in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right. Excellent. All right, so now we're coming down to the end of it. Uh, I just want to know. What would you say to one of your friends or family members that was like, hey, Benice, I'm thinking about moving abroad, but uh, I don't know, I don't know, I'm afraid. What would you, what would you tell them? What would you, how would you inspire them to make that move, to make that jump? I would actually tell them, number one, do research, and not research like charts and tables like actuary tables or you know go to an accountant but watch your vlog right and watch other vlogs that really talk about what's happening um what's it like to live as an expat abroad i found that that's that's been so helpful like when i think about even whether or not to visit a place but definitely to live in a place because now all the vlogs, and you have the vlog also, people are talking about everything, not just like, I'm having a zip line adventure, but you're showing your apartment, right? You're showing the food, you're showing the traffic. And so people can really close the gap as far as their, um, as far as lack of knowledge about a place and you can see almost like day to day because people are showing their apartments they're showing they're filming themselves at work they're doing every kind of thing so i think i would say to them do your research and then get a plan and really sit down get a plan plan out how much uh 
get a realistic idea whatever amount of money you think you're going to need for the first two or three months uh, save double that because you probably are going to end up needing that and then I would say book a one-way ticket All right. make yourself commit to the experience and it could be something like depending on how old you are some people I would say to them start off with a volunteer experience because some people if you're one of those people who you know have anxiety easily worried maybe you just start off with a volunteer experience where you spend like a month and then so there's an organization kind of shepherding you around and then for other people like me who are a bit crazy just jump right in like you're going to be okay and there's always there you will find your expat way because through facebook through vlogs you're always going to find your way and tinder and bumble I mean, you can, with Tinder and Bumble, you can always see like the location for where you're gonna go. You can set up dates before you even get there. And that's always nice to have some. I certainly did it in Vietnam. So, hit the ground running in Vietnam. I already had dates set up before I uh, got to Vietnam. And I think that made it, gave me something to look forward to. Made it a bit interesting. Yes, you know, get a little cuddle on, you know, a drink on with someone. And it, it just made it that much more exciting for you to arrive in that country. Yeah, knowing that somebody was also excited for me to meet me, yeah, that made it a lot more interesting. Okay, okay. I like it, I like it. Alright, now moving on, uh, if that same person came to you and asked, for specifics, not just life by life, right. that's about your life, but okay. but also like any books, any podcasts, magazines to help to further their research, further their excitement, further their their uh, their wonderlust. What would you What would you recommend? To them? Yeah, I still would say I still say Instagram. Okay. I really think Instagram and. gives you like before COVID there's any number of books that I maybe would have recommended to people but I feel like things are too fast changing and so I really think that with Instagram and YouTube you are getting like up to the minute information I just feel like travel has changed so much. Like there's so many, it's hard for me to, even when I was 17 years old, I went to Spain and I got off the plane and I saw palm trees. It was in Barcelona or wherever I landed. And I didn't know that there were palm trees in Europe because I just associated Europe with the cold. And so in my mind, like at that time, I was doing Lonely Planet, you know, which is still a good resource, but now I feel like even the travel magazines, as good as they are, there is nothing like a vlog, uh, Instagram stories to just kind of get you excited. Like I personally like Sheeta, uh, because she always she just talks about like her main mission in life now is to just get black women to travel she just wants black women traveling everywhere and so I would say get on Instagram get on Facebook because people want expats I find want to actually encourage other expats to come so don't be shy reach out if you want to know what it's like to be a woman living in Saigon then you go to Fexpats a woman living in Hanoi Hanoi beautiful they have black in Saigon black in Hanoi I would say don't um, yeah I'd say 
don't feel shy. People want to answer your questions because people want the community to grow. And they also know what it was like when they first got here. They had so many questions. And so I know I'm spoiling it um, as far as answering um, questions like a, a particular book. It's just that things have changed so much and I feel like <laughs> Like Instagram, people are curating a lot of really good um, information, not just photos anymore. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, speaking about Instagram and Facebook, if people wanted to connect with you, would you be willing to share? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so what would be your Instagram, or plug your Instagram, plug your Facebook, to get people to reach out to you and talk to you? Okay, please message me on Instagram. It's Venice Wilkinson. That's V E N I E S E W I L K I N S O N. One word. My sisters always make fun of me. They're like, only celebrities use their full name. And I was like, well. Wait, aren't you a celebrity? Of, yeah, I'm a bit of a celebrity. Hello. Plus, also. I just didn't realize how Instagram was supposed to work, so I just went ahead and used my uh, full name anyway, so it's easy to find me there. Okay, great, great. All right, we've got only a few more questions okay. left. I'm gonna go back, but you said something a while ago, and I wanted to address it. Okay. You said that one of the cons was feeling homesick. How do you get over feeling homesick? Well, now that my... I have a very active WhatsApp chat group with my sisters. There is less homesickness since they message about every little thing that happens in their life. But there's also, obviously, you know, there's a billion apps you can FaceTime people. But hanging out there at all the expat places, like there's so many expat places um, to hang out every city that I've been in. And all of that closes the gap with homesickness. There are tons of restaurants, supermarkets, all of those places are there. Lots of groups, like I'm a runner. There's so many groups and all of those things. And it's not just about hanging out with expats because I also like to hang out with uh, local people that I have a shared interest with. And that closes, I like to think that being abroad, I also have a family that I create, like a family of friends. Okay. Okay, great, great. And speaking of family, that's the next question. Were your family or friends supportive when you first wanted to make the move to Asia? Uh, yes, because I think they wanted me to break up with the person that I was seeing. So I think they're like, yes, she'll get away from him. So I think that's why they were like, yes. And my parents um, have a fondness for Korea because uh, Korea is like was, it's like a big Christian country. You know, they have like these mega churches. Um, and when I was growing up, the church I grew up in, Korean students who were studying abroad used to come to attend my church. So my family felt very close um, to the Korean culture, and we buy a lot of. Jamaican food products from Koreans. But I do have to say, after maybe year two, they're like, when are you coming? When are you coming? And now, this last time, when I went home uh, earlier this year, my family was really like, they were like, enough already. Like, come move back home like and I feel like my friends and family more and more are pushing me to come back home. However, uh, one of my friends from university, I was talking to her and she said another friend of hers who she grew up with, whom I met, you know, while because we were all like friends of a friend, she told that person like, oh yeah, we used to move to Asia over a decade ago and has never come back. And that girl was like, yes, that's the way to do it. So different people 
have a different um, response. I see some of my friends who have a, a husband and a mortgage and a kid. I can tell that a lot of them are like, uh, maybe they would like to live my life for a few days if they could do it. And uh, you've had an incredible journey, 14 years. If you could think back, what would be your favorite part? What was your favorite place to live? It, I would say my favorite place to live was Seoul because it was almost a coming of age for me. Because in my, in high school, I was a nerd. And what? then, <laughs> All right, and then I think between college and law school, I was coming out of my shell, but I didn't necessarily feel comfortable. So as a late bloomer, I think it was actually great to come of age in a place like Korea, where there is so many people to kind of support that. Because there wasn't any, because there wasn't anyone who necessarily knew me from before, they weren't trying to keep me in a box. Like I could flourish and I could really find who I was. Like I felt like the real me kind of, you know, kind of like, a, you know, that scene in Alien, Sigourney, with Sigourney Weaver and the alien comes out. I feel like, yeah. I feel like that's how it was for me. And you know, I I watched as Korea and K-pop and Korean drama uh, started to ascend new heights. So I think that made it also interesting because then people were just flooding into a place that I was I'd already settled into. So that made um, it nice. And I mean, you know, the army base there, air force base there, a lot of military guys, so yeah, also very nice place to be. <laughs> and great people, like the culture, Koreans are, because Koreans travel abroad so much, and we're, and really started traveling abroad more and more and more, I, I think it was just a great time for me to be in Korea. Because they wanted to learn more about the world and they wanted the world to learn more about Korea. And I feel like Vietnam is in that, getting into that vein now. Like Vietnam wants to welcome the world and they want to show the world Vietnam. And rightfully so. I think, yeah. I think uh, the world has been sheltered a little bit too much from Vietnam. Yeah. And Vietnam's doing some pretty amazing things yeah. here. Not trying to just be a fanboy. I pick this place because it's amazing, but it's also uh, becoming more and more advanced very quickly and doing that. So, okay, Venice, uh, we've talked a lot about your life and about everything. I want to know do you have a life quote or like something that you live by, a quote that, you, that, that defines Venice? Uh, yeah, I. So if I could tell where I got it from, I was watching years ago, and I don't know if they do it now, CNBC used to have this show called The CEO's Roundtable, and they were speaking to, I believe, the CEO of Condé Nast, or like one of those fashion publications. And the moderator wanted to know, you know, pose the question to all of the people, have you ever regretted a decision that you made? And I remember uh, this woman, I think she she's over, or it could be Hearst Magazine, but she said the only thing you ever regret about a tough decision or a difficult decision is that you didn't make it sooner. And that has stuck with me. And so it's not that I'm reckless and I just, make you know like I'll make any decision but it's made me realize that I can probably survive any decision but indecision really costs like you kind of have to just make your decision 
and you can probably deal with whatever happens. And when people say like, was it a good decision or bad decision? In the end, that's something that usually you find out five, six, maybe 10 or 20 years later. But yeah, the only thing you regret about a tough decision is that you didn't make it sooner. Okay, okay. That's a pretty powerful quote. I'll try. You even said it that you, if that was the only thing that you would change is that you would have moved sooner. Oh yeah. So it, it, it stayed congruent with, uh, with your life. I also think the same thing when it comes to making big decisions like me. My biggest decision to move abroad, it took me 10 years to finally pull the trigger and make that move. So listen, let's shout some wisdom on you. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that international travel is important? Why or why not? I got, years ago I got into a huge argument with my sisters about this and I backed away because it was such a terrible, um, such a, it got, is a very nasty argument. What's interesting now is that they're all traveling <laughs> abroad to all the places that I had said they should travel to. I think it's important because going back to the story I said about Europe and the palm trees, they're just things that you're never gonna find out in books. And I feel like when I was living abroad, studying and living abroad in Ghana, there were so many things that I found out about Ghanaian history, but also about European history that I would not have found out about if I hadn't been in Ghana. Because when you travel in places, like when I traveled to Croatia, and you travel to different places, you look at the architecture, and you start realizing like, wait a minute, this architecture reminds me of something I've seen elsewhere. And then you realize like how connected the world is. Like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, there was a Greek emperor that had ruled out of Croatia. Like you see all these different things and in the same way, when I was in Ghana, there were certain like, oh, okay, so this building is a Dutch building. This is a Portuguese building. So then you start seeing how the modern world was made. But I think a lot of times you just have to be in that place. Plus you end up discovering great food. You end up discovering like new hobbies, new people, language, so many fashions. My friend Rachel always makes fun of me because I like to buy, and I blame it on her. She was telling me about, uh, she said, when you have an apartment, she said, people need to stop giving you things that are not consumable or you can't just readily use. And ever since she said that, anytime I go shopping abroad, I try to find something that I can wear, like I'll buy shoes, I'll buy whatever. And so she always makes the joke that people will say to you like, oh, where'd you get those fabulous shoes? I'm like, oh, I got it at a little market in Mykonos. I'm sure if you go back there, I'm sure they probably still have it. And so that's always, ever since she said the thing about, don't just get things that take up space and get dust, collect dust. Like actually get living, breathing, things, not animals, but you know what I mean, metaphorically. So even with my siblings, I try to only get them things that they can use. Like, so everything that I buy as far as souvenirs, it's something that they can begin using immediately or something they can consume because I think when they see it and they use it, they think of me and when someone brings it up and they're like, oh, what is this? I think, and just, in general, it just adds to your life. It just makes you a more interesting person. Um, probably makes you a healthier person also, like mentally and physically, just from traveling abroad. Okay, okay, yeah. And I mean, that was gonna go into my next question, which is like, everyone benefit from it. 
based on your answer, that takes care of that. Oh yes, 100%. 100%. All right. Well, young or old. Young or old. I like that. Yeah, I like that. All right. Benice, camera's yours. You can say whatever you like. Is there anything that you would like to say to the audience and to the, the travelers, the people who are looking to travel out there? Take a moment, breathe, but buy the ticket. Just buy the ticket. Get on the plane, get on the ship, I don't know, get on the bus get in the car, just travel, see the world. If it's nothing else that we've learned from um, these past few years with the pandemic is that it's not just that tomorrow is not promised, because I don't want it to be like doom and gloom, but your ability to move is not always promised. Your health is not always promised. Go, just Go, do it. Go, do it, and hit the like button. Subscribe, leave a comment. Thank you very much, Venice, for coming on. And uh, hit me up on Instagram. Venice Wilkinson. Yes. And we'll see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe, stay awesome, travel well. Cheers. Cheers.